Welcome, everybody. My name is Franz, and today I'm going to talk about emergency accessibility debugging. Before I will start with the actual topic, I will just uh, present you some uh, general details about the presentation. So um, I expect the presentation to take around 20 minutes, probably a little bit less, because the screen reader won't work, because I don't have any sound here. But yeah, so probably around 16 to 17 minutes, I suppose. <laughs> Regarding the style, um, it's going to be a mix between a classical or frontal presentation, but I also, of course, want to give you a hands-on experience on what accessibility debugging would look like in general. Regarding questions, I encourage you to ask questions whenever you have them, during the presentation or after the presentation. But now let's dive into the actual topic. So that everybody has the same notion of emergency accessibility debugging, I want to uh, provide a definition. So emergency ac accessibility debugging can be split into two parts. There is the accessibility debugging process, which is kind of, which is the process of identifying accessibility flaws in your application, but also fixing them. And of course, there's also the emergency part. This means that the accessibility debugging happens not from the beginning of the development process, but during or after. And also that it's kind of time off because you wouldn't think of emergency accessibility debugging if you, I don't know, like had enough time for it. So you only have a limited amount of time for doing it. Yeah, so how would you do emergency accessibility debugging? I would suggest that you do three steps for it. On the one hand, you have to focus areas like <coughs> that you want to do your accessibility debugging on. Then you would have to do automatic testing, and last but not least, you would also have to do some sort of manual testing. For the focus areas, I would suggest to split the topic or like the process into two parts. On the one hand, there are like application independent focus areas, so general focus areas that you should always take care of when you do accessibility debugging. On the one hand, you have to make sure that the structure of your web application meets the accessibility standards. On the other hand, you also have to make sure that your application in general is, has navigability, meaning that no matter if you use a mouse, a keyboard, a combination of both, or a screen reader, everybody needs to be able to navigate through your web application. Beside this general focus area, there are also application-dependent focus areas, meaning that they depend on what kind of web application in the end you have. So for in order to identify this, you need to ask yourself two questions. On the one hand, what is actually the purpose of my website? For example, if you, I don't know, like have a showcasing platform for short stories, the crucial part of it would be that users can actually go to the short stories and read through them. But for example, if you have a blog, this probably wouldn't be enough because a blog is also about commenting on stuff. Right? So you would also need to be able to provide this functionality for everybody. Besides the question of what your purpose is or what the purpose of your web application is, you also have to think of your target audience. So who is going to primarily use your web application from an accessibility <coughs> point of view? For example, your web application might be used by, I don't know, like elderly people, then you would probably focus more on topics like contest ratio because an elderly, the elderly is usually not able to see that well. I don't know, if you have videos, you will need to make sure that, I don't know, like subtitles are provided or anything like that. When you're done identifying your focus areas for your web application, you would then proceed with automatic testing. The definition of automated testing is simply that you're using tools to do the identity to identify accessibility flaws. The benefits of automated testing is it's very easy to use, it's very straightforward. I will also give you a demo afterwards. It's fast <coughs> and it's a really good identifier of some very basic issues that your web application has. The downsides of automated testing though are that they're really bad at identifying everything that is not very common. So a conclusion of this for you should always be that you can never just rely on automated testing for doing accessibility debugging, even in emergency situations when you don't have much time left. Regarding solutions, I can tell you there are tons of them out there. 
different providers. I would say that the most famous ones are probably Google Lighthouse, then there's also the XDAP tools, if you've heard of X. And I think also Sign Proof is quite a big player, and Wave also, I think, is can be mentioned in this context. Once you're done with the automatic testing, you will then proceed with the manual, manual one. Manual testing, of course, means that you do the accessibility debugging by yourself, so by hand. The benefits of manual testing are that it's more holistic and more nuanced, meaning that you can really go into the depth of this and identify uh, accessibility flaws that are not very common or take, need to take a lot of different factors into consideration before you can actually make a verdict on what should be done. <coughs> this means because it's more holistic and more nuanced. This is, this is, an, this is an essential part of it. The downsides of the manual testing is that it just takes more time. And it also requires, of course, that you have a sufficient knowledge of accessibility debugging. Of course, you can't do manual testing or you can't identify accessibility flaws on your own if you don't even know what accessibility flaws could be in your application. Regarding tools, there is quite a variety that you can depend on in this regard. There are, of course, the browser developer tools, which I would especially mention Chrome and Firefox in this regard because they have by far the best developer tools when it comes to accessibility. Then of course you also have screen readers. They are also an essential part of accessibility debugging. There are a couple of different brands in this regard. For Mac OS, it's VoiceOver, I think for Windows, I think these that NVIDIA and Charles uh, are both um, for Windows exclusively. And then of course you also need to have resources that you can look up things if you're not sure about stuff or if you, I don't know, just make want to make sure or I don't know, if you're interested in anything like that. And for that, um, of course, you also have a lot of different sources that you can take into consideration here, but I would say that in general, MDN and W3C um, are the most reliable ones. Yeah. Now the question remains about time planning, of course ask yourself how much time should I spend on each step and of course there can't be there isn't like a golden rule to this it really depends on several factors for example for the focus area of course the more you know the application you're working on the less time you need to spend identifying focus areas because you already know quite well what is the crucial part of this application but it could also for example be that I don't know like you just started working at a company you're working for this team and this web application and you don't know quite yet what this application really does, so you're just starting getting into it, then of course you would need to spend more time on it. Automatic testing, I would just recommend you to do it for the focus areas, to just go through every single um, suggestion it gives you, and yeah, but also don't waste any more time than that, because the most essential part, as I already told you, is the manual testing one, so you should spend most of the time on this. Yeah. And now I think I've talked enough, and so I want to get into the interactive uh, mode now and do a little bit debugging session with you together now. For this, I created like a mock page of a technology block that doesn't really exist. I just created it for this application. We're going to use Firefox, um, and we're going to use the XDAP tools, which is the Firefox extensions. And for the manual testing, we're going to use a mix of the Firefox developer tools accessibility options that come with an MDN and W3C. I initially also wanted to do the voiceover, like a screen reader, but I don't have any sound and I just can't use the speakers for this. It wouldn't be loud enough, so I unfortunately we have to skip this part. Yeah, let's now go into it's now. So this is like the mock page I created, so a very simple one on the top you can see some sort of navigation bar. Then here you have like um, some sort of heading, then you have like an excerpt, an image, some more details about the page, some more text and some more headings. And on the end you have like a comment section, of course, this doesn't work, it's just here for mock up reasons. Yeah, and now as you, as we already know, there are like three steps, like focusing, identifying the focus areas, I already did that job for you now, so we don't need to like, find that out here. So this is something really crucial about this application, so we really have to identify the accessibility flaws here. 
So we can immediately skip to the second step, the automated testing one. And for that, I installed the XDev tools as I already told you. And once you did that, you have here a register called XDev tools. And it's as simple as that. You would just simply click on this little button and it would in no time already give you some examples. And what is really cool about this XDev tools is that you can just highlight it. So for example, here we have number one. Can you increase the font size? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Font size. Awesome, thank you. So here we have already the first issue that the element does not meet the minimum color contrast ratio threshold. When you go here, you can immediately see that this refers to this little aspect. And then already it also tells you why this is uh, what element in the DOM it refers to, you can see here in the top and on the bottom, you can see how you can actually solve this issue. So in order to solve this issue, you would have to um, provide a color contrast of at least 3.23. It already gives you also, um, you know, it also gives you a suggestion for it. Yeah, so this would be one of the accessibility flaws and then you can just jump right to the next one. Of course, it's quite obvious that this also has the same issue since it's same background color and foreground color. So here we have the same issue. We would need to provide a bigger contest ratio. So far so good for the contest ratio issues. Then we also have two other issues regarding images. We didn't provide any alternate text. When you go to highlight again, it immediately focus this little thingy. It's an image that kind of probably should work as a logo for the website. So it should take you to the home landing page of the website. The thing is, apparently, there is no description for this image, so it doesn't know if you, for example, use a screen reader, what this actually is. I mean, we might suggest it from the like, context and also by seeing it on the top left corner, that this could be some sort of um, home or landing page button, but for a screen reader, it doesn't you know, like, think that way or gets the information that way. This, of course, is not clear at all. Yeah, then we also have the second image, which is some sort of um, the single block detail image. This also doesn't have um, all text, so we would have to do kind of a similar thing here. We would have to provide a description of what this image in the end displays. Let's go on now to the third point, which is that links must have some sort of text, especially if there is an image here. So here we, it refers to kind of the same object because I'm like the same element, because this has an image and this is its kind of link and it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have an alt text template. So this would be the second thing that uh, we would have to fix in this regard. And then last but not least, we have an image, uh, an, an image and an issue with our HTML elements itself. Namely, that it says, the unordered and ordered list must only contain list items, scripts, or templates. And here apparently we have broken this rule somehow. If we highlight the element, it focus, it will just highlight the entire unordered list. So we would have to find out on ourselves what is wrong with it so it doesn't tell us this in this regard. Of course, I won't do like open my code editor right now and just do the fixing like in front of you. I already prepared like a second like copy of this where like all the automatic things have been fixed. But we can take a look into the console inspector and take a look at the issues, for example. So here, if you go into the document, into the like, uh, accessibility tree, we could go into the list. And now here you can see that we have provided a description for this. So it says landing page. So that people are aware that this is actually a link that leads to the landing page. So this would be the first issue that we have fixed. The other regarded, for example, the unordered list, if you remember. So if we went to the, um, so if you now look, take a look at the list, you see that we have two, three, four, what is that? Uh, so yeah, we have, this kind of accessibility thingy, and we have um, 
you also have to fix this. I mean, here it's not fixed, unfortunately. Um, I thought I had fixed it in this version, but apparently it's not. But of course, it tells you that we cannot have a list, uh, like a link directly as a descendant of a list. So we would have to provide a list item in this regard. Yeah. So far so good, I won't go through every single detail now. You can see I provided also a better contrast ratio for a thingy so that um, for like this um, tags or how you ever want to call them, also provided a description for this one. So let's now get on with the manual testing. As you remember, I told you that structure is very essential when it comes to a web page. If you, for example, take a look at what, I don't know, W3C tells you about page regions, it will tell you that you should have some sort of at least a navigation. You should use like the semantics for the navigation bar, like nav. You should have, if you have a main content, and usually you have a main content, then you should have a main um, semantic HTML element. And then you should also use, for example, if you have a footer or anything, you should use the respective elements for this. So let's now take a look at if our website actually has the so if you take a look at the document, so of the web application itself, you can see that there's literally nothing like there here. If we double check it with the inspector, with the regular DOM, you can also see that we just have divs here, div, 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 div. So nothing else but div. And div in a semantic point of view means literally nothing. So if you wanted to stick to the rules, you would have to provide for the upper, like for the um, nav bar, we would also have to provide the respective HTML element, namely the nav. For the rest of it, which is or can be considered part of the main content, you would have to use the main, um, the main HTML elements. So far, so good for the page regions because we don't have like a footer or anything else. So it would be already done with this part. Yeah, another thing that we can at, uh, because it's also about structure, is headings. For a screen reader user, headings are an essential part, meaning that you need to provide headings that make sense. You should always start with an H1. No heading level should be skipped, and they also have to make sense. So for example, if you, I don't know, like have a section and you start with an H3, and then suddenly you have, I don't know, like it's a subheading in H2, that wouldn't make any sense at all. So let's just check that dynamically here in the DOM. For example, if we go to this, heading, you can see that this is actually an H2 and not an H1. So this would be already wrong from a semantic point of view. So we would need to change this to an H1. If we then go down and check for the other, um, for the other headings, you could see that here we have an H4, for example, which is also a risk, like breaking the rule because if you start with an H1, or I don't know, like in our case, an H2, you would at least have to provide an H3 and not an H4. So you would have skipped one level in this regard. So you would have to change this as well. Same goes for all the other things. So here we have always the same kind of procedure. We always have H4s. Instead, it should be H2 because we already didn't start with an H1 right um, beforehand. So we would have to also fix this. And yeah, so let's go on with the headings. For example, here we also got another heading and this is in H2. So this would actually work fine because, you know, we start with an H1 and this is like a totally new section or we can think of it as a totally new section. And then an H2 would be fine for this regard. So yeah, there are no other headings in this regard. So we, we are settled for this thingy. Since we have a block and we can consider like the comment section as an essential part of every blog page because usually you want to interact with a blog, you want to kind of give your own opinion or at least pretend you have an opinion on this topic. So you also would need to be able to interact with this section. Let's take a look at the text area we have here. So as you can see, we have here some placeholder text, but not a label. This is also a problem because when you take a look at the labeling controls, it also tells you that we always need some sort of label for an input type, no matter what it is, also if it is a text area. So already broke this rule. In this regard, we would have several root solutions for this. So here we are again. For, we could, for example, simply put, I don't know, like 
a tiny little label up here that would for example work or we could also if we didn't want that one so if you didn't want to show something um, visually we would at least have to provide an area label for you for this an area label is simply nothing else than putting the label directly on the element so this just is useful for screen reader users because you don't see it directly on the page yeah so if we did that, so if we put, um, added some sort of label, no matter if it was visually visible or an area label, we would have fixed this issue. Yeah, so that's so far so good. So of course we could now go on with the debugging, maybe find some more things, but I think you got some idea of how it's done, how you can jump behind, um, jump between the different, um, with the accessibility tab and the inspector tab. How you can actually also check the web pages. I mean, the thing is, it's a little bit counterintuitive because I wanted to work quite a lot with the screen reader and it doesn't work. So it's not the optimal situation I was hoping for. But yeah, still, I think at least you've got like a basic understanding of how it's done. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, please. So the DOM and the semantic elements can the automated tests not detect that? Uh, it, I mean, it depends a little bit on the tool, but generally they're not really good at this kind of stuff. You know, they're usually restricted to identifying color, contrast, ratio thing is like missing all text. So this is, these are the things that they're really good at usually, but everything that's a little bit more complex, they will usually fail. That's why I also said that you cannot really rely on them. So you really need to do manual testing as well. Because like manual testing, in this case, would mean not actually looking at the page, but looking at the source code, and then it's kind of easy to detect the like the flaws. So it, it, yes, exactly. it's not black box testing. It's like you need to look at the code. And actually, the developer has to do it, not the tester. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, first of all, you identify the focus areas. You already know which parts of the web application to look at, and then you would just really interactively look at the parts of it. Already have some, I don't know, like web pages open. Maybe you also have some knowledge already of accessibility. Then it's of course much easier. But otherwise, you would have to also read through these things more carefully. But I kind of did that job for you now because we don't have the time for this. Yeah. So let's go back to the presentation now because I still have one slide left. So yeah. So some final words about this. Um, <coughs> so my talk was not about using emergency accessibility debugging whenever you can, but it should be quite the opposite actually. Em emergency accessibility debugging is not something you should ever embrace. The thing is, you don't always have a choice. Sometimes you're just faced with the situation and you have to make the best out of it. And that's exactly what I tried to explain to you, how you can proceed in this situation. Instead, with accessibility, you should always or whenever possible implement it from the very beginning of your um, development process. The thing is, there are so many good reasons why you should do this, but so I just listed some of them, like there are ethical reasons, there are monetary reasons, bigger target group, more revenue in the end. But there are even self-centered reasons, to be honest, because in the end, we all get older, uh, eyesight will always get a little bit worse, so we have grandparents, we know that their vision got a little bit worse, maybe they cannot hear that well anymore, maybe they have motoric issues. There's so many things to consider, and I think we all want to get old, so at one point we will all benefit from having an accessible web application in the end. But yeah, even though I really don't encourage you to do any emergency accessibility debugging, I think you can still take a lot from it, even if you don't do it in this emergency um, scenario. Because the methods I described to you, like the automated testing and the manual testing, would still be the very same when you did it like from the very beginning. So you would have to use automated school, automated um, tools to identify like very easy accessibility flaws, and then you would just go into depth. And whenever you create something, really take into consideration what would be the best accessibility be for this part and then just implement it, it accordingly. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. I have another question. Yeah.